Hi, and welcome to the European Tours Life on Tour podcast. I'm your host, Ewan Porter, and today I'm joined by a man who's had a fabulous last 12 months on the European Tour, including a couple of sensational victories. Antoine Rosner, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Now, look, I know you come from a, a very talented golf family. Your mother was, uh, was a terrific golfer, I believe, and your brother played on the Challenge Tour and some satellite tours around Europe. It, I, I'm assuming it's your mother. Is that how you got into the game of golf? Yeah, definitely. Uh, my, whole, my whole family plays golf and um, <clears throat> the whole family is, uh, is really into golf and uh, especially on my mom's side. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much her who got us uh, started with my brother. My dad started a bit later when uh, he met my mom. So, but um, <clears throat> both of them were very, very supportive um, with us, with uh, both my brother and I. And uh, yeah, I think that they played a, a big role for us um, going into golf. Was that the only sporting pursuit growing up or was, uh, were there other sports that you were playing there? No, no, no. I played all different kinds of sports growing up. Um, I love every sport, uh, but I played uh, in a club uh, field hockey until I was uh, 15 years old. And um, yeah, I think uh, when I was 15, I had to make a decision, you know, because uh, playing the, the two sports at pretty good level was, was getting difficult. I had the the hockey games on Saturdays and I also had some tournaments on the weekend so it was getting a bit difficult and I had to make a decision so I, I just stick to golf um, when I was 15 but I, yeah I played all different kind of sports tennis skiing um, yeah how, how old were you and your brother before you could actually beat your mum and your dad on the golf course oh <clears throat> good question uh, <laughs> probably my dad uh, around maybe 11 year old and my mom a bit later, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so she had the bragging rights in the family over your father, yeah. obviously. Well, she's a scratch handicap, so uh, I, we needed a little bit more time to, uh, to beat her. That's pretty impressive. Are they still heavily involved in, uh, in your golf career? Well, they're just very supportive, you know, they, um, they're not involved in involved in any way, but uh, they're just very supportive and they follow me uh, every week and yeah just uh, following up with me after every round. And um, yeah, I like it. So growing up just outside of uh, Paris, Antoine, what, what type of golf courses uh, were you growing up playing? Were they par three courses? Were they nine hole courses? How easily accessible were they for you at that point in your career? Well, I was, uh, I was pretty lucky growing up because my parents were uh, members in a really nice, uh, you know, old country club kind of course uh, called uh, La Boulie. And uh, it's it's an old course, it's over a hundred years old, so it's pretty short, but it's very tricky. A lot of dog legs, a lot of tree lines, a lot of slopes on the green. So uh, I think it's nice when you, I still go there a lot for practice because it, it, it's really good for practice. You have to shave the ball a lot. You have to have, you have to be creative around the greens, on the greens. And um, I think it's really good. And uh, that's where I, uh, I grew up. I played a lot as well, Golf National. Really lucky I live 30 minutes away from Golf National. And I think it's a wonderful place to practice. It's so hard. You have to hit great shots everywhere. And uh, it's a lovely place. And um, so, yeah, I think I was uh, very lucky growing up uh, around these few courses uh, west of Paris. Yeah. Uh, growing up playing junior golf and amateur golf in in France, there's a lot of guys that you that are around the same age as you or similar age to you that have gone on to have tremendous success on the European tour. Victor de Buisson, Victor Perez, Romain Langasca, Alex Levy, Mathieu Pavon, uh, the list goes on. I can imagine those junior days especially, it must have been it must have been fun, but also very competitive. Yeah, it was fun. It was it was very tough as well, because I remember when I was under 18 year old, I wasn't one of the best junior golfer. And uh, it was pretty tough back then to uh, be, let's say, just on the French team it was pretty, pretty tough. And I, I don't think I really played much um, team event with friends before 18 year old. I think I've only played one tournament with friends before. Um, so it was it was very competitive indeed. And um, but, you know, once we all turned pro, I think it was just pushing uh, one another to uh, get better. and. Um, in the end, uh, Victor Dubuisson showed us, you know, how to do it back a few years ago. And uh, I think he opened opened the gate to uh, 
you know, be on one of the best golfer in the world, play on the Ryder Cup team. And uh, he showed us it's, it's possible, you know, because we all grew up together and uh, he did it. So why not all of us? Who were some of your golf, golf idols growing up? Well, in France, Thomas Lové definitely played a big role. He's from the same uh, club, uh, golf club at home. So uh, he was very involved with my golf club. And uh, yeah, I think I, I really looked up at him a lot. And um, and then obviously Tiger Woods, you know, he's a, he's a different man, nothing nothing else to add. And uh, and yeah, he uh, he inspired all of us for sure. Well, in 2012, post junior career, you chose to take the college golf pathway in the United States. You attended the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Now, a lot of European uh, Europeans, when they do go the college route, they tend to gravitate more towards the warmer climates. And uh, like Kansas City, Missouri is not exactly known as a 12 month of the year golf paradise. So, so why Kansas City for you? Well, I had a really good. Um connection with the coach it's tough to explain but uh once i started looking into schools so i wasn't good enough to look into the the main or the bigger schools there is in the in the division one so i was looking kind of more of like uh, mid division one schools and uh so i was talking to a few schools and i think uh i actually met the coach at a at a junior tournament and we had a really good feeling we had dinner together and uh and uh, yeah, just we just got along very well. I had a great scholarship as well. Um, he offered me, and uh, I think I think it just you know worked out really well. And um, so I got there, and uh, everything was going super well. My golf was getting better and better, and uh, yeah, I just loved it. And I uh, I spent really like four four amazing years there. Look, the the college golf pathway, uh, as we know, it, it, it's an excellent. It's an excellent pathway uh, to professional golf. Do you feel like it really helped prepare you for life on tour, your four years there? Yes, definitely. Um, I think it prepared me not only for the life on tour, I think it prepared me well to uh, be a man, really, because, you know, you're 18 year old, you go to the other side of the world all by yourself, you become a lot more independent. And uh, I think it's very important important when you're on tour because you're all by yourself or with your caddy or maybe a couple teammates and uh and i think yeah you gotta take care of your business and um i think it's very important and um you know it's uh you learn also a different language for me learning english was very important just traveling around and uh you know for our job is it's essential so uh no i think it was uh definitely one of the best thing i've ever done in my life and uh I don't regret it, and uh, I think it definitely built me as a man uh, a lot better than uh, maybe if I would not have gone. Well, I mean, you, you really enjoyed a, a pretty successful college career, Antoine. Six wins and then a tie for eighth at the 2016 NCAA Championship at Eugene Country Club in Oregon. Wonderful old school country club, uh, that golf course. But when you look at the, the names on the leaderboard from that NCAA Championship, Aaron Wise won it. John Rahm finished runner-up, but you finished ahead of some incredible names, really. Colin Morikawa, Scotty Scheffler, uh, Maverick McNeely, Will Zalatoris, Cameron Champ, so many future PGA Tour winners. Did you have any inkling at the time just what a special group, what a, a special time uh, to be a, a college golfer that was? It, it's funny you say that because I was only looking at the names in front of me at, on that leaderboard of that uh, 2016 national championship and um, all the names in front made it on the big stage like big time John Ram and all these guys but I didn't really look at the guys behind me and it's pretty funny that Colin Marikawa and all these guys were behind I didn't know that uh, I'll have a look after this uh, this call at that leaderboard again um, <clears throat> but uh, no I think uh, <clears throat> you know I think college golf is very is a very good school of golf. I think all the best amateur golfers go there now because it's the only path really to uh, keep studying and play competitive golf, I think. So uh, in America, it's very much in the culture. In Europe, a bit less, but a lot, a lot, you know, golfers from over here now decide to go study over there. And uh, I think it's a really good path to the professional world, really. Well, following you, your college experience, you did turn professional. You spent a couple of years on the Challenge Tour in 2018 and 
2019. A couple of wins out there, finished eighth on the Challenge Tour money list in 2019 to earn your European Tour card. How was your Challenge Tour experience? You know, Challenge Tour is not easy. And uh, you get out there, my first year, uh, I was discovering everything and uh, didn't know the courses, didn't know the guys I was playing against. And it wasn't very easy. And uh, what's tough is when you want to make it through is you got to finish. I mean, back then was top 15, now it's top 20. But top 15 is really not a lot of guys. And that means you pretty much need to win at least one event if you uh, if you want to graduate from challenge tour so it's not easy um you really got to play hard you got to go out there and you know give your best every week you can't skip a tournament you have to play every week to uh to finish top 15 so it's not it's not easy but uh in the end i think if you really have the if you're good enough you're going to make it through at some point it took me 2 years uh some guys make it in 1 year some guys make it in more um but in the end, all that matters is to actually make it on the next level. And uh, But back then, it, it, it really, I got two wins. It really helped me a lot uh, going into my first year on European Tour because winning is hard and wherever you play is hard. And uh, you got to learn how to win. And I think the Challenge Tour really prepared me well for that. How did you find traveling to a lot of those places on the Challenge Tour? Because it can get fairly off the beaten path. It's not too bad because you mainly stay in Europe Western Europe as well. At the end of the year, you go in China, but um, traveling in in Europe with the European Union and stuff is fairly easy. And um, I thought it was it was we go to good cities as well. You go to Prague, you go to Madrid, you go to a lot of beautiful cities. So it was pretty pretty enjoyable. Well, your first event as a European Tour member at the end of twenty nineteen, you played the a Fraser Bank Mauritius Open. Uh, it was. A bittersweet week, I guess you could call it, because uh, quite incredible that in your first event you you were involved in a playoff and unfortunately lost that to Rasmus Hoygaard. But I guess obviously disappointing to lose the playoff and not get that victory, but at the same time in your first event to get off to such a quick start, that must have been pretty exciting for you. Yeah, it was it was such a good week. I think I'll remember that week for a long, long time because it was my second European Tour event. I played the week before, I think it was Leopard Creek, and uh, it was a beautiful place to play as well. Mauritius is wonderful, and uh, a lot of French uh, people live there, and uh, and yeah, it was, a, it, it was a great week. I think uh, there was a lot of uh, birdies out there that week, and I played really well. I think I... Uh, my attitude was really well, because I was, I was pretty nervous, to be honest. My second European Tour in like ever and you're in contention and uh i think i handled myself pretty well and um that playoff yeah was tough but there's nothing else to say i made three birdies and lost and rasmus is just a yeah it's just so good you know he's only so young and uh he made birdie birdie and eagle to win so not much to say he was uh he was incredible in that playoff and uh you know all credit to him i had a great week yeah, you certainly did. Well, look, it was only about three months after that that the pandemic struck, uh, took everyone uh, by surprise and obviously stopped everybody in their tracks. But did it give you an opportunity to sit back at home and reassess your goals and your plans going forward? Because I guess till that point, your life had been pretty hectic from college to challenge mm. tour to the European tour. Looking back, it was good to uh, be at home for a little while. It's something I've never done in my life, as you said. And um I think it was, um, yeah, a good time to 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 spend some time with uh, my girlfriend at home. And uh, but on the other hand, it was pretty frustrating. You know, it was my first year on European tour. I wanted to play all these tournaments. I had a great start of the season with that playoff in Mauritius, and uh, it was pretty frustrating. I wanted to keep going, you know, and I wanted to uh, play those big tournaments, those beautiful courses that we have on European tour, and. Uh, yeah, it was frustrating. And then you know they decided to freeze the categories, which meant. I was going to keep my chance to graduate category and not play the Rolex series the year after and everything. So it was pretty, pretty frustrating as well. Cause uh, I thought I deserved better. Cause I was like, God, I'm playing well. I should be next year. I should have a, a great category, play all those Rolex events and stuff. So it was pretty frustrating, but in the end, I got that win in Dubai that, you know, changed everything for me. And, uh, so looking back, no, it was just a good time to spend some time with my girlfriend at home, something I um, I probably won't do 
again for a long time. So uh, it was, yeah, I think it's just, you know, something you, everyone went through and uh, it's just uh, something you can tell uh, the kids in the, in the, in the future. Well, you referenced that win in Dubai. It came 12 months after your playoff loss in Mauritius. 25 under there at the Golf in Dubai Championship to win by a couple of shots. And that was a pretty stellar field. That must have been a pretty uh, special feeling. Yeah, I think it was definitely one of the best golf um, I've ever played. A uh, lot of birdies, some crazy low scores out there. And uh, and it's not easy because you got to persuade yourself to keep pushing and pushing and go for more birdies and more birdies, even though you're in contention. Just making pars was not enough. So you had to push forward on every hole. And that's that's what I did really well that week. I was persuading myself to keep pushing hard. And uh, yeah, I got a crazy final round, eight under to uh, to win by two. So uh, that was just insane, crazy golf. I putted really well. And uh, I think, yeah, I uh, handled myself really, really well as well that week. Again, it was not easy out there to go and make more and more birdies. Well, you didn't have to wait long for that second win. Three months later in uh, March 2021, you captured your second title in Qatar. When you were standing on that 72nd green tied for the lead and you had a 60-foot birdie putt, did you realistically think that you had a chance to hold that? <laughs> uh, to be honest, I didn't even think about it. I was just like trying to have the good speed on that putt because it was such a long putt. I was like... You need a good speed. You need to make two putt. Or I didn't even say you need to make two putt. I was just focusing on the speed. And uh, and then, I don't know, I just had the perfect line on it. I had a good read. And uh, and yeah, when I saw that ball turning back right to left at the end and I saw it going straight in, I was like, is that is that really happening, you know? And uh, yeah, I think even I said that before, but even in your biggest dreams, you can't, can't imagine holding a 60-foot putt to win a tournament. So... It's uh, it's good because now with the new technologies and stuff, I still had that. I still have that video on my phone, and I look at it sometimes, and it brings the good memories. And uh, and yeah, it was just. I think it's it, it was a once of a lifetime putt, and um, yeah, it was it was a crazy crazy moment. How much did having won in Dubai three months prior to that help you down the stretch when you're in contention? I think it just it helped me a lot because it felt familiar. It was so close to the one in from Dubai. It felt really familiar, and I didn't have as much pressure as uh, when I was in Dubai. And uh, I was just feeling good on the course. I was feeling great, and uh, I was just playing my round, not not you know uh, worrying about what's going on with the other guys or whatever. And uh, yeah, it just felt great, and that helped me a lot for sure. Uh, the win from Dubai. And your caddy, Irishman Darren Reynolds, there. Uh, he's obviously been on the bag of some some pretty uh, top quality players in the past. So was he a big assistance to you as well? Yeah, for sure, for sure. He uh, he plays a big role. He's a uh, he makes me play so aggressive on the course that when you're in contention, I think it helps you. It helps you because sometimes you could be thinking, oh, I'm gonna maybe play a bit safe here and there, or whatever. But he's so much into we have to keep pushing and make birdies or whatever that it helps a lot he's got the good words uh you know for um to keep you in the moment and um yeah i think he he's won a lot of time before with uh mcginley and uh paul dunn and some other guys and uh he's played a Ryder cup before so he knows what it's like and um that's what i was looking for really when i got on the european tour i was looking for a caddy of experience and i think I think that helped me a lot, for sure. As golfers, we're always striving to achieve more, and whether it's trying to graduate from the Challenge Tour to the European Tour or move top 50 in the world or make a Ryder Cup team, now that you've got two European Tour wins under your belt, mention the Ryder Cup is obviously a big goal of yours, but are you going out there feeling a little less pressure that you you have the exemption from the wins and you have a couple of wins under your belt and you know that you're as good as anyone out there? I don't think there is less pressure because you have pressure all the time. Um, you have to go out every week and give your best and you always have, there's always a lot of expectations and you have to play well every week. So 
Um, having a win and an exemption doesn't really change a lot. I think uh, you can't rely too much on that exemption. Um, but uh, no, I think I think you have to prove yourself every week. That's why this this job is tough. Is every week is different, and you start over, and you can't you can't rest really. You have to you have to keep practicing and play well every week. So no, there is no time off really. You have to just keep fighting and the pressure is always there no matter what you do so if if you're number one in the world people are going to expect you to win every week if you're 55th in the world people are going to expect you to be top 50 so you always have bigger goals so no you can't rest well a couple of weeks after qatar you traveled back to the united states to play the wgc match play championship in austin texas and you really announced yourself to the United States audience there, but I have a couple of interesting or a couple of questions about that. First of all, I'm referring to your victory over Bryson DeChambeau, but those, I mean, those of us on the international golf scene and especially in the European tour knew exactly who you were, what you'd achieved. Essentially, you were one of the hottest players in the world of golf, having won two, uh, twice in three months leading into it. Did you feel disrespected at all that you weren't so well known in the US? No, not really. I think it's quite understandable because they don't they don't really know or they don't really look at the the smaller European tour events, so it's not it's not how to say it's uh it's not a bad thing that they don't know you. It's just they don't really look at, you know, the smaller European tour event and uh but I think it was probably a good thing for me when you arrive and you play Bryson DeChambeau, he doesn't know you. It's it's not necessarily a bad thing. You can go out there and prove him. You can beat him. And I think that's what I did pretty well. Was there much chatter during the match? Not really. <laughs> I think I was really quickly one up in the match. I won the second hole. And uh, I think after that, there was not, not much talk after that. And... Um, yeah, no, not much talking at all. Claiming his scalp, did it feel a little bit extra special or was it just, it, it did come in the round robin matches or was it just another win? No, it was not just another win. It was, it was very special. It was my first world golf event. My, you know, I, I haven't played any majors before that. It was my first world stage event. And I go out there and I play the hottest player there is on the planet, Bryce Neshambo, just won Bay Hill a couple of weeks before everyone is looking at him so i knew i knew that match everyone was gonna have a look at it and uh it was pretty stressful i was really nervous before the first uh before the first hole because uh you know i knew everyone was gonna have a look at that match and uh, it was for me the first time ever and um i was really nervous again the birdie on the second hole helped me so much just to get into that round and you know i was like all right here we go birdie i'm one up Let's go. We can we can play now. It's 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 going, you know. But uh, it was it was not just a simple win. When after I won on eighteen, there was all those media interviews and you know the golf channel interview. So it was special for sure. And what about the the crowds as well? Because Bryson tends to I've been out there walking around with him uh, in commentary quite a few times as well. He tends to bring a bit of a different audience in with. Uh, you know, his long drives and, and what he's doing for the sport. How did you handle that that particular day? I think a lot of the people were actually cheering for him. He's from Texas. He was We were playing in Texas. And uh, so there were, he had a lot of fans out there. But it was still the end of COVID. So it was not full capacity out there as far as fans. And uh, it was actually all right. So I think the, the it, it was not like the Ryder Cup. People were actually respectful uh, with me as well. And... Um, I think I handled it really well. But after the run, I received quite a few messages on social media and stuff from Americans congratulate me. And, uh, and yeah, it was, a, it was pretty fun. Well, you played your first major championship in 2021 at the Open Championship at Royal St. George's. Fabulous links layout. Made the cut there. How was that experience? Yeah, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. So close from home as well. Just like four hours drive from Paris. Uh, I only wished my uh, my close friends or my family were allowed uh, in the UK at that time. They were not, uh, but uh, it was still an amazing experience. Great setup, 
full crowds, uh, beautiful weather. We, we couldn't expect a weather like that for the Open. It was blue skies every day. And uh, no, it was just it was just beautiful. There's not not much to say. I played with some great players. Played with Ricky Fowler on the on the third round in two ball. Amazing experience. Um, yeah, it was just my first cut in the major. I think I'll I'll remember that week as well for a long time. It was it was great. Over the last three years, between the Challenge Tour and the Europe two years on the European Tour, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you've made 55 of 67 cuts. And I think one of the most underrated statistics in professional golf is the cuts made statistic because there are so many variables, as you know, week in, week out, things can go wrong. It's hard to be consistent. You've obviously found a recipe that works for you. So what is it? Why the consistency? I think my long game is very solid. And I think when your long game is solid, you can pretty much play every course around the world. And... um, and yeah, I think I just work hard week to week and there is, you know, nothing is ever, you, you have to work over and over on your game. And I think I, I understood that quite well. And, um, and yeah, just, uh, I just feel, I don't put myself a lot, a lot of time in trouble on, on the course. And, uh, I think it's a, it's a big strength and, uh, and whenever my short game is, is hot, I'm usually in contention. So, um, I think that's why. That's why I make a lot of cuts. My long game is, is very solid and that's, that's a big strength. Well, I'm sure you watched recently as the United States team dominated Europe in the Ryder Cup at Whistling Straits. But let's go back to 2018 at Le Golf National in Paris. You attended every single day uh, of that event, which was obviously just fabulous to watch from the outside. I can only imagine what it must have been like to, to be there. But how much did being in attendance fuel your fire to be a part of the team in the future i think it was an amazing experience it's not every every year you have to ride a cup just 25 minutes away from home you know and uh so i had to be there i had to uh i was there at 6 a.m the first day to, just to be ready for the first tee uh on the on friday and uh yeah, it, it gives a lot of extra motivation. It, it was an amazing experience. It's one of the best sporting events I've ever been in my life. And the organization was unreal. And the course was superb. Two fantastic teams. And yeah, just the atmosphere, the spirit of the guys on the course, you know, the fire they have. I think it just gives you a lot of motivation. And that gave me a lot of, yeah, hope. And I think Rome in two years will be... A huge goal for me. I know I'm gonna have to do a lot better to be on that team, but uh, it's definitely a huge, a huge goal on my list um, in the future. Well, golf has never been the most popular sport in France, but did did you feel like after that Ryder Cup, it started to pick up a little bit? It picked up a little bit. I think the the numbers are not as good as the people hoped, really. Uh, but. Uh, I think what really helped golf is is COVID. After COVID, I think uh, golf got a lot more popular because it was one of the only sport uh, we were allowed to play after COVID. Uh, but the the Ryder Cup really opened opened it to the the French people in general. It was on on national TV. It was it was everywhere on TV, you know. So a lot of people who didn't know golf got introduced to it. And after that, COVID came, and maybe the people saw a good opportunity to. You know, get started, and maybe the Radica played a good role, but just two years later. Well, you mentioned Rome in 2023, which is the venue for the next Ryder Cup. We're already seeing a little bit of a changing of the guard out there on the European tour with yourself, the Hoygaard twins, uh, Bob McIntyre, Guido Miliozzi. Do you expect some of you, if not all of you, and perhaps other young stars coming through to be on that team in 2023? I mean, that would be great. We all go along really well with one, one another. So uh, I think we're all good friends. And uh, yeah, I think it would be it would be really fun. We all we all still young, especially the, the Hoshgaard brothers. But uh, but um, yeah, I think we, we we've all played a lot of golf together growing up. And uh, I think if we can be on that team all together at some point, it would be would be great. It would be it would be pretty fun. Yeah. I've got, to, I've got to ask you about your Olympic experience this year in, in Tokyo, representing your country, playing golf there at the Olympics. You know, I know watching it, I was glued to a 
to a bronze medal playoff. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. how often do you sit glued to a TV watching someone battle out for a tie for third? I mean, it must have been a pretty special experience to be a part of. Yeah, really special experience. We got to spend a few days on the Olympic Village before um, before moving to the hotel by the golf course. Uh, it was an amazing experience. The atmosphere there on the village is crazy. You get to walk around, you see all those athletes wearing their uniforms and their countries, you know, colors and everything. And everyone is at the top of their shape. The boys are strong in the gym out there. It's like a museum. It's like a museum going in the gym there. You see, you know, a boxer walking out next to a gymnast. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's something I'll never forget for sure. And, uh, yeah, you, you understand that you're not only playing for yourself, you're playing for something a lot bigger, a lot bigger than representing your club team or whatever. It's, it's a whole different level. Representing your country in the Olympics and having the opportunity to bring a medal home is, is something absolutely insane. And yeah, it was, it, it gives you a lot of extra motivation. That's for sure. And, uh, I was pretty disappointing with my week golf wise, but, uh, yeah, it was such, it was still an amazing memory. And, uh, if I could be in Paris for 2024, I think it would be, it's definitely a, 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 a the one goal of a lifetime. You know, it, it's something play the Olympics at home would be, whoops, would be insane. And, um, it's, uh, I even got the Olympic tattoo just as a reminder as well that for 2024, I want to be there. I want to be in contention for a medal. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, a it's a goal of, of a lifetime. Having the access to all the other athletes from all those other sports there, did you, did you have the opportunity to speak to any of those other successful athletes and perhaps try to tap into their brains and what makes them so successful? A little bit. Uh, we knew before the Olympics a few tennis players, so we got to spend a bit more, a bit of time with them. And uh, if, what was really fun was uh, flying back from Tokyo. We were probably 300 athletes on that plane. Uh, so it was, it was pretty fun. It was just a good moment. We got to share all together. Um, yeah, we got to speak. Uh, I got to speak with a few uh, judo athletes who got a lot of uh, gold medals in those Olympics, and uh, having got got to hold one of the medal in my hand, it was pretty fun. Yeah, but uh, they all they all super nice, and um, yeah, it's something I want to I want to do again for sure in Paris. I remember you referenced the the gym at the Olympics, and I, I think I read a tweet about just I think Justin Thomas put on Twitter that when he went into the gym at the Olympics, that uh, safe to say that there were no one else reaching for the 10 and 15 pound dumbbells. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was pretty funny. I remember that. Uh, yeah, no, the, the, I think the gym is definitely the the thing I'll remember the most. It was insane, like probably 3,000 athletes in the same gym and the best athletes in the world. It, it was crazy, yeah. I, uh, I won't forget that. So Antoine, let's. Uh, you've got a week off, right? You're you're at home. You're you're in Paris. How does a week off uh, look like for you? Are you out there grinding? Are you practicing? Are you trying to get away from the game? What other recreational activities are you into to take your mind off the off the sport? Well, so this week, for example, so I just came back from a three weeks uh, stretch of tournament. So I'm taking a few days off, three four days. I'm lucky enough to be in the center of Paris. So there is a lot of things to do. I like to meet my friends. I like to um, go out for lunch, you know, in the nice restaurant there is in Paris. And uh, yeah, there is my family. There is uh, all my friends. I'm with my girlfriend at home. I like to spend time at home. It's it's uh, it's really enjoyable. It's one of the best cities in Europe. And uh, yeah, and then when I go practice, uh, there is the gym on site on my home club. So I like to um, do a morning workout when I go there. And then practice, like to do some good wedging sessions and, and then, yeah, go out on the course, play nine or 18 holes. And that's usually what my weeks look like. Um, there is my coach in South of France as well. So I usually go out, go down, uh, in the South to, um, to meet him, uh, but usually two or three days when I'm here, not more. Cause as well, again, I like to be at home and, um, yeah, that's it. I'm. I'm more of a city man, so I like to be in the city, meeting with my friends and uh, just, you know, take some relaxing time. 
All right, well, we're going to try something a little bit different here to, uh, to wrap up this podcast. I'm going to send you some quick fire questions. Okay. Best course on tour? Wentworth. Why Wentworth? That's actually a controversial one because a lot of people don't like the new Wentworth. They prefer the old one. Uh, there's a lot of conjecture on social media about it. I personally like it, but why, do, why, is, why is it your favorite? I think it's just a really, really tough track. First of all, I think it's it's a tough one. It's uh, you have to hit great shots. You have to be very precise. You have to, uh, you know, shape the ball. You have to uh, handle yourself personally really well because you can't. Uh, there is no easy holes, so you have to always be focused for five hours and. Uh, it's just also very beautiful. It rem- reminds me of a course in Paris called uh, Morfontaine. And um, it's, it's just very, very beautiful out there. Favorite city that the tour goes to? Uh, Madrid was pretty fun. Great city, but not Paris? Well, we haven't been to Paris in two years on tour. So uh, <laughs> uh, I think, no, I just, I think it's really fun to walk around Madrid. A lot of restaurants out there, a lot of, uh, the atmosphere is really cool. And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, also, we were allowed to go outside as well. We were starting to have some freedom on, in our lives on tour. So uh, no, I think it was just, a, it was a fun week. Which event has the best food? Rob, definitely. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that one. Yeah, no, Ita- Italian food is uh, something else. Best friend on tour? Uh, Romain Longasque. Well, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but which event, non-major, would you most like to win? French Open, definitely. No question. Did you attend a few French Opens as a, as a kid? Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot. I was even uh, working there uh, growing up, trying to make a bit of money before my holidays or whatever. So, uh, no, I think it's just uh, I've been attending pretty much every time they played uh, at the Golf National. Best player you've played with? Played with Adam Scott on a Sunday in America. It was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Such a nice guy and what a player. So uh, it, was a, it was a great memory. Dream practice round group on tour? Uh, I would say with Robin Roussel because there is always a good money game involved uh, with those practice rounds. A couple of others? you gotta, you got to pick a couple of others. I'm assuming it's Romain uh, Langasque in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With all the French boys, we, we like to have uh, some games during the practice round. So uh, it's pretty fun. But uh, no specific name. But with Robin, we always do uh, some, uh, some good games. How do you treat practice rounds out on tour? Are you, are you someone who spends five, six hours out there and dissects every part of the golf course or you would prefer to have a, a fun money game and just relax a little bit? No, I prefer to have a game. Uh, you know, we're so competitive out there, just playing around just for practice. I mean, to me personally, it could get boring sometime and it's, it's, it's very slow out there as well, those, uh, those practice days. So um, <clears throat> no, um, I like to have a game. Well, look, Antoine Rosner, thank you so much for joining us in the Life on Tour podcast today. You've, as I said, you've had a wonderful last 12 months on the European Tour and even prior to that, winning on the Challenge Tour. And uh, fingers crossed that you'll be on that European Ryder Cup team in uh, Rome in 2023. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. To watch another European Tour video, click here. And to subscribe, click here.